Welcome on behalf of Presbytery, and I hear the good folks of Dunfermline Abbey say welcome on behalf of Dunfermline Abbey. We come joyously to celebrate God's call. God is the one who claims, convinces, cajoles, and calls 
to ministry. We are here to celebrate that and to ordain you and Richie to the holy ministry of word and sacrament. So it is good to be here. As the disciples said on the Mount of Transfiguration, it is good to be here. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. But to each of us grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts Christ gave were that some should be apostles, some prophets, and teach, uh, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity as a people, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Let us pray. God of all time, we praise and adore you for breaking into the darkness of this world with the glorious light of your presence, a light which made your love for the world visible in the babe born in Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, a light which guided those gift-bearing travellers from afar, to find and worship the Christ child, a light which leads us to you, now revealed in Jesus Christ. We pray that you will accept our worship, for it arises from hearts and minds in awe over the enormity of your gift to us of pure love. Gracious God, we would like to be among those who saw the coming of the Christ child, those who dropped all that they were doing and traveled to worship the coming of God's love into this world. We would like to be those who cared for God in infant vulnerability, who tickled and cuddled and comforted the growing child that he might know love and safety. And yet, merciful God, we must recognize all the times we are more like Herod Whenever we, in our actions or our inactions, find our own need for control more compelling than the needs of others for health and safety. Whenever we cling to the security of our privilege rather than standing up for the rights of the oppressed. Whenever we are complicit in the harming of innocence for the sake of profit or power or because we fear to know and to change the injustices of this world. Loving God, we confess our sins against you and one another and pray that you will fill us with your light, that we may live our lives as true disciples in your name without counting the cost. In the name of Christ, the one who showed us the way, God's light is present in this world, present in the Christ child born to lead us out of darkness, present in the star, in all that guides us to love. God's light is in the world and the darkness did not overcome it. God's grace is in the world and our missteps and mistakes will not overcome it. We are loved we are forgiven. Alleluia. In Christ. Amen. Now our Bible readings. Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus, reading from chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending to the flock of Jericho, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Herob, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. 
So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him and within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Our reading continues. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. And now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that, you are, that it is to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. The second reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you to our three Bible readers, all of whom have a personal connection in, in training uh, or supervision with, uh, with Ewan. So it's good to have that personal connection. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, we sing.
May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I was tempted this afternoon to ask you all to take your shoes off. The space, after all, for the purposes of this afternoon, is holy ground. Now, I've drawn back from that because partly I wasn't sure where I was going to keep all your shoes. And I didn't think I could find enough slippers in time. It has been New Year. Although there's plenty in the sale. But more than that, there is a memory of Monday, Thursday, just last year here, where I know that people are not comfortable about exposing their feet. We didn't wash feet. We did, however, bring a basin of water to the middle of the church. And I've never seen so many people look terrified. But that memory still lingers, so I'm not going to have you take your shoes off in reality. But I want you to imagine your feet. Feet are symbols of vulnerability. There are those amongst us who don't want anyone to see our feet and probably don't want to look at anyone else's feet either. Because, you know, not everybody's feet are beautiful. At this time of year, they can be quite dry and tired looking. The nails don't need much of an examine at this point because nobody's going to see them in a pair of sandals. For some of us, our feet are the weakest part and the most vulnerable part of all of us. Some of us are very tickly around our feet and the thought of anyone touching them terrifies us. They can be overly sensitive and there are some amongst us who don't like to walk on the stony beach because it really does hurt. And no matter how strong our feet are, Lego always hurts. <laughs> Things that cripple us on our destinations to the places we hope to reach. Yet feet and the journeys they make are a subconscious part of talking about faith. Within scripture, they can be a symbol of the overthrowing of power where the enemy is placed under the foot. They can be the opportunity for new beginnings as they set out on journeys. They can be that sign of vulnerability, a place of devotion as the feet of Jesus are anointed with perfume, a moment of destruction with the piercing of nails. Feet within scripture might be one part of the body, but they give expression to a range of understanding of God, of faith, and even of ourselves. Feet mark moments of transition, of leaving behind an old way and moving to a new future. I picked both our readings this afternoon knowing that they were well known. For the Presbyterians among us, the story of Moses and the burning bush is an important story to our denomination. Many Presbyterian congregations have that symbol of the burning bush in their buildings. We're no different here. It hangs just here. Reminding them that God's presence burns and enlightens us. Our traditional understanding of this story of the call of Moses notices Moses taking off his shoes to walk on the holy ground that surrounds the burning presence of God. We understand this as a moment of fear and awe. In our imaginations, we see a trembling Moses, afraid for what might be asked of him by God. Moses certainly speaks of his fear and uncertainty when he asks if there might be another who could do the job better. 
A little research around the removal of shoes in Eastern culture suggests that taking off shoes marks a moment of transition, of leaving an old way of being behind and moving to something new. This story of the theophany of the burning bush is a transitional moment for Moses. He moves from being the small child found in bulrushes and brought up within Egyptian culture to become an adult with purpose and potential to offer a revelation of the presence of God within the world. So in this service, when we affirm Ewan's call and ordain him for the purposes of ministry, the story offers a traditional moment of transition. But reflecting on the practice of the removal of shoes in Eastern culture, I want to take you to Japan. Academic Carla Suomala notices that research in Japan suggests two reasons for the removal of shoes. The first is to keep houses and floors clean. The house is recognized as a special place and the dirt and dust of ordinary living is left at the front door before entering the security and warmth of a home. The house is recognized as a sacred space. But there's a second reason offered in Japanese culture for the removal of shoes. And that's for people to be able to relax and be themselves. Just for a moment, imagine if God asked Moses to remove his shoes because he wants Moses to be himself. I mentioned at the beginning, exposing our feet can make us feel very, very vulnerable because for some reason, all of our anxieties and imperfections seem to be visible in the thought of our exposed feet. But I hope that adds a little bit of depth. What if when we remove our shoes as we enter a holy space, we're being asked to be ourselves, to be comfortable in the presence of God and give a full expression of who God has already made us to be. Congregation member, elder, minister, deacon, parish worker, no matter our role, we're all invited into that holy space of God to understand how our gifts might best be used. In the presence of God, we remove our shoes and along with the fear and vulnerability we feel, we're invited to be comfortable with who we are and to use who we are for the purpose of serving God. The second passage was equally as familiar. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, offered by Jesus, tells us to go make disciples, baptize and teach. These are words addressed to disciples, not one or two with specific roles and functions, but to all who would choose to follow the way of Jesus. I think one of the fascinating things about that passage is that it actually has an earlier echo in the Old Testament. And you, as an Old Testament scholar, will be fully aware of this. It's words similar to words said by the king of Persia as he sets the people of, or the Jewish people, free from their exile. A call for them to go and be the people they are in their new land. And so Jesus takes those words to the disciples and asks them to be the people they are in the new land. 
where they go to represent him. Their words dressed to disciples, not with one or two with specific function and roles, but to all who would choose to follow the way of Jesus. The four verses we heard didn't say go, and as you go, make sure you learn how to speak properly and that you've learned everything you can possibly know about Reformed theology. They didn't say make disciples, but make sure they're the ones that are easy to get on with and know what it is to be a team player. They didn't say baptize and teach only those who are willing to listen and easily found. Instead, the Great Commission is offered to a set of mismatched people with varying gifts who are asked to be themselves in the presence of God and to allow the presence of Christ to be revealed in who they are. The Great Commission is gifted to a world full of pretense where people think that they should conform to roles defined by the world in which they live. And through the Great Commission, God instead says, I choose and love you because you are you. Let me help you to reveal who I am. Whether we like it or not, we are all called from at the top of our heads to the tip of our toes for the service of God. Holy ground is not a sacred space within our church buildings, but the world in which we live. And the taking off of our shoes is the metaphorical experience of stepping into the world and encountering that God is already there. This afternoon, we are all asked to be ourselves. But in the ministry that Ewan is being invited into in this moment, Ewan is being invited to be himself. In this moment, he is being called to a role that allows him to use gifts he already has to the best that he can. He's not being asked to suddenly wear magical clothes, or as I refer to them, wave the magical hands. Instead, he's simply being asked to be himself and to use the gifts and talents he has. For all of us, those are vulnerable moments. We can't hide behind the expectations of others. Instead, we live in the expectation of God. When we walk through the doors again and leave this building, we leave the safety and security of what we believe to be the presence of God and instead walk into the vulnerability and the awe of the holy ground beyond the door. And there may we be ourselves. And in being ourselves, may we each bring a unique opportunity for our gifts to offer Christ's presence to the world. Amen. Can I ask you all to stand as we share in the statement of Christian faith? We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise God the Father who created the universe and keeps it in being. He made us his sons and daughters to share his joy, living together in justice and peace, caring for his world and for each other. 
We proclaim Jesus Christ, God the Son, born of Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became one of us, sharing our life and our death. He made known God's compassion and mercy, giving hope and declaring forgiveness of sin, offering healing and wholeness to all. By his death on the cross and by his resurrection, he has triumphed over evil. Jesus is Lord of life and all creation. We trust God, the Holy Spirit, who unites us to Christ and gives life to the church, who brings us to repentance and assures us of forgiveness. The Spirit guides us in our understanding of the Bible, renews us in the sacraments, and calls us to serve God in the world. We rejoice in the gift of eternal life, we have sure and certain hope of resurrection through Christ, and we look for his coming again to judge the world. Then all things will be made new, and creation will rejoice in worshipping the Father through the Son in the power of the Spirit forever. Yes. Amen. We sing the hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. Take your seats apart from, apart from you. You remain standing here. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, who being ascended on high, has given gifts for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are met as a presbytery to ordain you and Ritchie to serve as an associate minister in Dunfermline and working in a wider capacity across presbytery by prayer and the laying on of hands by presbyters to whom it belongs. In this act 
the Church of Scotland as part of the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, worshipping one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, affirms anew its belief in the gospel of the sovereign grace and love of God, wherein through Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, incarnate, crucified, and risen, He freely offers to all people upon repentance and faith the forgiveness of sins, renewal by the Holy Spirit, and eternal life, and calls them to labor in the fellowship of faith for the advancement of the kingdom of God throughout the world. The Church of Scotland acknowledges the Word of God, which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, to be the supreme rule of faith and life. The Church of Scotland holds as its subordinate standard the Westminster Confession of Faith, recognizing liberty of opinion on such points of doctrine as do not enter into the substance of the faith, and claiming the right, independence on the promised guidance of the Holy Spirit, to formulate, interpret, or modify its subordinate standards, always in agreement with the Word of God and the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the said confession, of which agreement the church itself shall be sole judge. Ewan. In view of this declaration, you are now required to answer these questions. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess in you the Lord Jesus as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you believe the Word of God which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the supreme rule of faith and life? Do you believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the confession of faith of this church? I do. Do you acknowledge the Presbyterian government of this church to be agreeable to the Word of God? And do you promise to be subject in the Lord to this presbytery and to the general assembly of this church and to take your due part in the administration of its affairs? I do. Do you promise? to seek the peace and unity of this church, to uphold its doctrine, worship, government, and to cherish a spirit of love to all your sisters and brothers in Christ. I do. Are not zeal for the glory of God, love to the Lord Jesus Christ, and a desire for the salvation of all, so far as you know your own heart, your great motives and chief inducements to enter into the office of the holy ministry. They are. Do you engage in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ to live a godly and circumspect life and faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully to discharge the duties of your ministry, seeking in all things the advancement of the kingdom of God? I do. I now invite you, you in to sign the formula. Come forward and sign the formula. The formula states, I believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the confession of faith of this church. I acknowledge the Presbyterian government of this church to be agreeable to the word of God and I promise to observe the order of worship and the administration of all public ordinances as the same are or may be allowed in this church. The hymn which expresses Ewan's sentiment of trust and dependence at this moment, indeed in every moment, all my hope on God is founded. We sing.
please be seated and I invite presbyters to come forward and as I instructed earlier on those who have the closest uh, connection with, with Ewan to, to be uh, near at hand for the laying on of hands. Laying on of hands symbolizes the, the prayer that we all uh, express now, either spoken or silently, as we ordain Ewan to this holy ministry. Let us pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you call us in your mercy, you sustain us by your power. Through every generation, your wisdom supplies our need. You sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Apostle and High Priest of our faith and the Shepherd of our souls. By his death and resurrection, he has overcome death, and having ascended into heaven, has poured out his Spirit, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip all for the work of ministry and to build up his body, the church. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this your servant Ewan, whom we now in your name and in obedience to your will by the laying on of hands ordain and appoint to the office of the Holy Ministry within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, committing to you an authority to minister your word and sacrament, to shepherd your flock and to share in the government of your church. We give you thanks that you and us heard and responded to your call to this ministry. May he be for us all a source of strength and inspiration, that with him we may share in the ministry of Christ, bringing reconciliation to those who are divided, peace and healing to those who are broken, justice to those who are oppressed, and hope for those who are lost. Bless to his family, wife Gail and boys Jacob and Taylor. Give him and them joy in serving you. Give him patience in affliction. Keep him faithful in prayer that he may be kept strong in your service until with all your servants you bring him to share in your eternal joy through Christ who died for us, rose again and lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Ewan, I now declare you to be ordained to the office of the Holy Ministry. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, and by authority of this presbytery, I introduce you to serve as Associate Minister at Dunfermline Abbey and across the Presbytery of Fife. And in token of this, we give you the right hand of fellowship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you richly and bless you. Now, I know you have been wanting to do this, so let's do it.
to your, your seat while the, uh, the choir sing the anthem. Let all the world in every corner sing. That was inspiring, thanks to the, thanks to the choir, choir master. This part of the service, as we begin to draw to a conclusion, is entitled The Charge to You, and so um, I don't have a charge sheet, but could you stand and then sit down? Thank you. <laughs> Just some exercise. You and we, your sisters and brothers of the Presbytery of Fife, rejoice with you that through the love and mercy of God you've been called and ordained to the ministry of word and sacrament within the church of God. And I charge you in the name of the church to seek to be worthy of your calling with a humble spirit and a grateful heart. Work for the building up of the body of Christ, together with the parish minister and the people to whom you're bound. Share in the ministry of reconciliation of all things in Christ Jesus. Care for the people of the church and parish of Dunfermline Abbey. As you exercise your own gifts, encourage them to seek out to use their own particular gifts. 
As you pray continually with and for them, gratefully receive the love and strength that they also offer to you and to your family. Seek to exhort and teach as one who is also under the authority of the Word of God. Through sermon and sacrament, bring to God's people maturity of faith and send them out to live and serve the Lord strong in the Spirit to the glory of God the Father. Reach out to those who have not yet come to faith. Honor what is worthy in their lives. Love them as God's scattered children and seek to bring them safely home. Do not neglect the gift that you've been given. Be a faithful student of the Holy Scriptures and what you read you may believe, what you believe you may teach, and what you teach you may practice. Pray with perseverance. Renew your mind. Refresh your body. Open your eyes to be filled with the fullness of God. Being ordained at Epiphany, the manifestation, the revelation of the Lord Jesus and of God to the Gentiles, to all peoples, a marvelous message for any time of the year. Now, may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do his will, working among us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. I want to ask you, Ewan, don't feel you need to tell me. I want to ask you, do you have any nicknames? Don't feel you need to tell me. I'll, I'll share. I've got two. One I live up to and one I live down. Read a book. Well, read by name, read by nature. I live up to that one. One touch. I try to live that down because it speaks to my uh, lack of finesse at playing football. The believers were first called Christians at Antioch as an insult. And yet they and we, down through the years, are called to live up to that name, to live up to the name of Christ. In my previous parish in the Black Isle, in the village of Och, the last place God made, Och, that'll do, they were in, inveterate nicknamers. And there was an Episcopal canon many generations ago, Canon Spence Ross, who was nicknamed Piffany. Epiphany, maybe because he was always speaking about, at this time of year, the Epiphany. So he was nicknamed Epiphany. But it's a, marvelous, it's a marvelous inspiration for ministry that God has a message for everyone. He has a church for anyone and has a place for you. Always keep that in mind, that the gospel is for everyone. The church is for anyone, and there's a place for you, and you, and you. A number of years ago, there was a, an American uh, drama and mind team that worked with us in Kinghorn and Burnt Island, and one day, one of the, the, one of the leaders was um, pigeonholed, was earwigged by a local worthy, who thought he was insulting me, who said, see that, see that minister, see him, he's always speaking about Jesus. Jesus this, Jesus that. Even at funerals, he's speaking about Jesus. You know, and I took that not as an insult. I took that as a nickname, if you like, because when it comes down to it, it's all, it's all about Jesus. So keep, keep that at the heart of your ministry. Whatever nicknames you may be given, whether you want to live up to them or live down them, folks, will see and share in, through, and with you the gospel, God's love, God's care. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray. God of all good gifts, who freely gives all to us, have mercy on us and grant us the peace that only the Prince of Peace can provide. Grant that our lives would be an offering and that our work would be a good gift, just as the gifts that the Magi brought, pleasing to you and fit for the King of all creation. We look to you, our prophet, priest, and king, to rule the world with justice, 
and to give salvation to all who call upon you. God of wonder and mystery, God of the stars and the universe, God of winding ways and straight paths. We gather today with gratitude for the gift of your constant presence, your trustworthy guidance, and your daring risk-taking with us. You dare to love us despite our inability to respond fully. You dare to care for us despite our challenge in caring for others. You dare to walk with us despite our fickleness. On our own journeys towards the stars and guiding points you put before us, you continue to lead us forward, guiding us by the teachings of Jesus to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly in your loving shadow. We pray for peace in this world, Lord, the kind of peace in which we celebrate diversity, are joyfully challenged by adversity, and share in the joy that is to be found everywhere. We pray for those who are lonely, that you might lead us to reach out and be friends. We pray for those who are hungry, that you might lead us to offer sustenance. We pray for those who are lost, that you might lead us to give hope and direction. We pray for the countries of the world, that we might find a way to work together to lift one another up for our king, queen, and royal family. We pray for our leaders in Holyrood and Westminster, that your spirit might guide them to set an example for our country and the world to work together rather than against one another. We pray for our Church of Scotland and all branches of your church in Scotland that we may seek to build up this body of faith. We pray for all our leaders that they may continually seek your Spirit in their lives and their daily decisions. And we pray for ourselves that we might continue on this journey, learning the lessons you offer, seeking the fullness of your perfection, and live as you would have us live. These prayers and hopes we offer in confidence and gratitude for your love and your presence. And unite us in these and all our prayers, in the prayer our Savior has taught us, and we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we sing, for everyone born a place at the table.
that Christ walks to bring justice upon the earth, to bring light to those who sit in darkness, to bring out those who live in bondage, to bring new things to all creation. May this path run through our life. May we be the road Christ takes. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Now, there are refreshments, um, which I think are over in this direction, yes. Um, so please remain standing as the choir and as presbytery leave, um, and you'll have an opportunity to get to the refreshments before we do. Everybody say, 